I guess let's get started with U.S. politics. With upcoming with elections coming up in less than three months, would there be a preference for Hong Kong of who wins? If, if say if Biden wins, what would that mean for Hong Kong? Well, I think uh, everybody's own politics is their own. Uh, we don't know who is going to win, but uh, if there's a change of government, then I think China and Hong Kong and I think the rest of the world will be watching how uh, U.S. diplomacy is going to be possibly uh, uh, restructured. And perhaps uh, the U.S. with the rest of the world, they, I mean, I think people don't have a problem with robust discussion, uh, but how that's done uh, is very important to the rest of the world. Okay, so I guess we'll have to certainly wait and see what that means, especially if tensions, of course, come down a notch or two, which I guess might be good for everybody. Uh, in, in the previous segment, Ms. Lowe, we spoke, and I just want to turn the conversation now to Hong Kong as a financial center. We spoke with our, you know, Stephen Engel, and we talked about this big IPO coming to the city at Financial, among other big listings that have come here, vast majority of which have been mainland Chinese. The reason I simply bring that up is the topic of Hong Kong as a financial center has been an issue uh, correctly or not, uh, during these conversations, is it? Do you think it's a bad thing if Hong Kong simply becomes, say, China's international finance center? Well, I think being a international finance center for any city is very important because the fact that you're international means you are open to the world. Uh, the Hong Kong dollar is convertible, which the renminbi is not. Uh, and you remember a time when, for Chinese companies that went to list in New York, this was a very big thing. It was a very sexy thing to do, and Chinese companies did do that. Uh, over time, I think, with U.S.-China tension, particularly the expectation that U.S.-China relations uh, is actually going through a geopolitical shift in power, and therefore uh, the, the argument between U.S. and China could go on for many years. Uh, therefore, I think Chinese companies are the, the notion of coming back home, so to speak, and listing in Hong Kong or having a secondary listing in Hong Kong uh, is a good thing to do. Uh, and uh, I think also, again, developing the market on the mainland, the Shanghai market, the Shenzhen market, uh, are also very important, I mean, in policy terms for the Chinese government, but I think also for investors around the world. Uh, Christine, I just wanted to get your views on the ties between some of the elite here in the mainland, members of the party, members of the government and Hong Kong. There was some fascinating reporting by the New York Times a few weeks ago highlighting what they said were links between Lin Jian Shu, his daughter, and a number of assets and holdings she has in Hong Kong. Just broadly, to what extent do these ties and these financial links between senior members of the party here and Hong Kong shape their views, their calculus on how to approach Hong Kong? I think the interesting thing about Hong Kong, uh, and you could say a number of other uh, markets around the world, uh, is that they are um, they're very open. Uh, money come in and money go out. Uh, there are things that you can invest in Hong Kong, particularly in property, because property assets uh, are, are very high in value. Um, so. I mean, if the implication of your question is if the Chinese elites are able to invest here, is that going to swing how they look at Hong Kong? Well, I mean, maybe I can just put it in a more practical way. I mean, today, um, with the renminbi being uh, not yet convertible, Hong Kong remains the place where China can do business. China mm. needs to raise an enormous amount of money for all kinds of infrastructure and investments. Hong Kong is also a very convenient place for the rest of Asia to do business. So the traditional strength and uh, foundation of professional availability here to be an international finance center for Hong Kong, it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, I mean, people's concern is with Hong Kong being more a part of China. Hong Kong is, of course, already a part of China. But, you know, becoming more of a part of China, uh, is this going to be uh, a problem for the rest of the world? And I like to think that that's, that doesn't have to be the case. What is the one potential policy action that Washington could, Washington could take vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hong Kong that concerns you, that keeps you up at night? 
Well, um, I think for us, for, for us in Hong Kong, I tell you what our biggest concern is. Uh, in the U.S.-China conflict, when they're delivering punches on each other, uh, Hong Kong worries very much that, you know, we're, we're in the middle and we're the collateral damage. Uh, we worry, being a, a finance center, of course, that the U.S. may um, uh, weaponize the dollar so that it becomes more difficult uh, to, to do business. Uh, but the good news was perhaps yesterday where uh, the Chinese side and the U.S. side said that they're going to carry on uh, with their uh, phase one trade deal. I think this is an important message. Um, now, obviously, it, with China continuing to import large amounts of American products um, over the course of the next year, uh, the Chinese will have to pay for it with the dollar using the dollar system uh, and the banking and financial system. Therefore, is it an indication that uh, there won't be any further weaponization of the dollar that will harm China and uh, also Hong Kong? Uh, Ms. Lowe, I'd just like to ask a final question before we, we let you go, and obviously against the backdrop of LegCo elections being pushed back here. Uh, with the new national security law, there have been questions on what now the pro-democracy camp and that movement can actually continue to push. How do you see that part of the political spectrum in Hong Kong continuing to exist or evolve moving forward? keeping within the confines, of course, of this new legislation and without pushing the limits and without crossing it? I think it's very important for the opposition camp in Hong Kong to think about their future strategy. I think the first thing is, um, I think they need to uh, acknowledge that China is the sovereign power. And if you're willing to acknowledge that, then the opposition has to develop a strategy of communicating with China so that you can lobby China, you can negotiate with China, uh, you can find areas of compromise with China. But through all of those, what you're trying to do is to lay out something that Hong Kong people want. Hong Kong people do want uh, an increasing level of uh, democracy here. Um, we probably won't get it if we're just going to uh, thumb our noses uh, at Beijing all the time. So we do want our opposition to be much more clear-headed and clear-minded and telling us how they're going to deal with Beijing in a way that will end up by getting us what we want, which is a more democratic system going forward.